this week on the WriterCon podcast. Uh, figure out what you like to write and then figure out how to write it to market. I think that's the biggest challenge. I see a lot of new writers that say, I like to read this one very interesting, unique thing. But then when they try to write it, it kind of isn't matching anything in the market. And while you do right. want some uniqueness in what you're writing, you still need to satisfy reader expectations. So read what you love and then try to learn to write in a similar vein what you love. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Laura Bernhardt, award-winning author of the Wantlin Files book series. Hey there, writers. Thanks for joining me and Laura and Jesse. Hey, we got a lot of catching up to do. Since our last recording, we've had uh, wild presidential conspiracy theories and the Grammy Awards and last week in the Super Bowl and what's the common denominator in all of the above? Jesse? Uh, <laughs> conspiracy? Taylor Laura. Smith. Oh, Taylor Taylor Smith. Smith, of Taylor. course. She wins Final Jeopardy. And Taylor predictably figures in one of our news stories today. So, uh, Laura, should I assume that you're a Swifty now? I am a fan of her music, and I have <laughs> been since she first started crossing over into uh, pop music. I can remember when I was listening to Love Story way back in the day. Oh, but why is it a pop star that's dominating popular culture? Why isn't it a writer? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, James Patterson has to take a vacation every once in a while, so... <laughs> <laughs> does he, well, he, do, he does dominate a lot of things. I'm not sure pop culture. I don't no. see him dating a. That would be Kansas amazing City's though. Chief. If we could, we could fill those big arenas, and I could be up there in like the Wouldn't secret it? outfit with the boots, just reading, reading out of my book. That'd be amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You should live yeah. and going crazy. I would love that. I but. feel like that could happen in England. Like they have a whole event. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen these on YouTube, but like they have events where like they have celebrities and actors and whatnot, or like authors come read like random letters that are like funny or weird, like either historical letters or current letters that were like written to like the telegraph or whatever. And they have like Benedict Cumberbatch read it and they're very funny. And it's like in a full auditorium to just like hear people read letters. And I'm like, this is why wow. England is in some ways better than us. Uh, so I would be willing to let Benedict Cumberbatch read one of my books. Yeah, what do you right? think? <laughs> That'd be great. Okay, our interview today is with a very special friend of WriterCon and friend of all of us, writer, uh, writer Lauren Smith, who is a Major League USA Today and internationally best-selling romance writer who I had the privilege of teaching in a small group retreat many years ago, which probably had nothing to do with her later success, but I'm going to brag about it anyway. Longtime listeners will recall that Lauren was interviewed in in the first season of the podcast, like the fourth or fifth episode, but she's a busy person and we haven't managed to get her back yet until now because she's not only on this podcast, she's also joining us for the writer con cruise. So we'll talk to Lauren about Lauren about all of that and more, but first the news. All right. First news story today does not yet have anything to do with Taylor Swift, but has a lot to do yet. with... Yet. Yet, right. But wait for Goblin Butts. Now, you may recall... Yes, you heard me right. On a previous episode, we broke the biggest story of the year. Well, the biggest story for me anyway, the fact that one of my books was banned in Florida, even though no one can really figure out why a thriller published by Random House in 2005 offended someone, but whatever. I'm pleased because it put me in the company of some of the best writers who ever lived. And now I'm even more pleased because it puts me in the company of, you guessed it, Goblin Butts. Yes, you heard me correctly. There it is. For those of you watching on YouTube, Jesse is showing you the 
offending book cover. You may remember a couple episodes when we made our prognostications for 2024. We anticipated more book banning. And what can I say? We've already got it right. Because a Florida school district has drawn over the cover and other illustrations in multiple award-winning children's books in its libraries after the chair of the local Moms for Liberty chapter complained that some of the characters were naked. Okay. Kind of like you see nakedness in a very limited way sometimes in Marie Sindak books and whatnot. But, but in this case, one of the offending characters, a goblin whose backside is vaguely visible. So a woman named Jennifer Pippin submitted multiple formal challenges at the end of last year. One of the books she took issue with is Unicorns Are, Unicorns Are the Worst, which won a Florida State Children's Literature Award. Why? Because the main character, a goblin, is shown with his butt facing the audience. Something someone probably thought was cute and funny, but apparently... Some people in Florida have found it inappropriate. Who's correct? You decide. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the offending button question right now. And Jesse, can you bring up what it looked like after they literally drew pants on the goblin in actual physical copies of the book? Pants. He's it cleaning like his overalls. Yeah. Also, he's cleaning his pants. On like that's the act he's doing. He's like the smock would. Anyway, this is stupid. It's a stupid story. Uh, <laughs> is it better? I mean, it's more boring. But uh, well, first of all, it looks you incredibly offended? fake. Uh, you what? It looks incredibly fake. Like the cover, yes. the cover overalls. Um, well, what do you expect? They just drew on it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is like if if listen. If you're really concerned about a goblin butt, first of all, goblins aren't real. Um, <laughs> second of all, like if you're into butts, that's a you thing, okay? Yeah. <laughs> or if you're offended by them. But yeah, or if you're offended by them, that's also you're a your thing. You know, kids see much worse than a goblin butt on a daily I would basis. Would imagine so. Now, Laura. Mm-hmm. I hear rumors that you are a mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you put Real, several- oh, newsflash, newsflash. <laughs> And you put several children through public school. I did. Did you ever object to a book they brought home or something you found in the school library or anything no. like that? No. I find books open doors to important conversations. Books that deal with issues are incredibly important to our children. This I wouldn't have considered an issue. But let's be honest. Anytime a child would get silly or giggly about that. I, again, here's another news flash. <laughs> Everyone has a butt. I really <laughs> even think goblins. That, even yeah. goblins. Uh, what what do these parents do when they take their children to the zoo? Do they <laughs> take them to the zoo? God forbid they see an animal use the restroom or anything like that. I I think it's very important from my perspective as a parent, I was always very um, matter of fact with my children about these things and they didn't become fixated with them. They grew up mm-hmm. healthy and well-adjusted. I think when we as parents make a big issue out of it, the children then develop a fixation and mm-hmm. think that there should be some stigma surrounding this. And why are you going to make your child uncomfortable about their butt? <laughs> we all have them. I should add in fairness to the state of Florida that not everybody is on board with this. For instance, another parent, a man named David Flint, asked Moms for Liberty why they were, this is his word, sexualizing a drawing, quote, of a goblin's bare backside. It was not inten- included to cause arousal and was of a fictional character. Flint also pointed out to another challenge from the same person to a book called Sofia Valdez, Future Prez, because, according to the claim, the main character's grandfather was shown in one scene wearing a pro-LGBTQ pin. Well, maybe, but the illustration is so small that it really could be anything. Somebody's seeing 
a pink triangle where there may not be one at all. And um, I mean, it's kind of related to the butts thing, isn't it? When people are seeing pink triangles and worrying about yeah, that, it when okay. they're That's not really you. there. Yeah. Yeah. And also what's wrong with that? Right. Yes. Yes. Well, that's so, the next question. Uh, yeah. All right. New uh, story number two. At last, we get to Taylor, and this is about the fake Taylor Swift book that nonetheless racked up sales. This actually started a few weeks ago, but I'm finally getting it to getting to it now because we finally know the end of the story. This book was published by Bantam. May, uh, it's an imprint of Penguin Random House. Them again, major publisher. They released the book Argyle, which of course is a tie-in with the H Henry Cavill film that came out, what, like a weekend or two ago? Mm -hmm. Anyway, the novelization is it attributed to the author, Ellie Conway. Technically, it's a movie tie-in edition, but the controversy is about how this book was marketed because even though it's attributed to this Ellie Conway, which is a pen name, and the actual authors were not identified. This publisher was working pretty hard to make people believe it was written by Taylor Swift. Now, let me just, uh, uh, Jesse, can you show the picture of the cat in the backpack? Just in case you aren't a Swifty, you may know, or you may not know, that she has a Scottish fold cat, a breed which is now insanely popular because of Taylor Swift. And if you've watched the documentary that's on Netflix, it's called Miss Americana, you can actually see her walking with a backpack that looks a lot like this one with a cat that looks a lot like that one poking its head out the window. Now, to be fair, the one in the movie isn't Argyle, but it's well known that Taylor really likes that pattern. So all the pieces were in place, but it got out of control. Obviously it didn't take long before the Swifties who are apparently a, a, a formidable group of super sleuth, sleuths picked up on all of this and started debating on the internet. Could it really be Taylor Swift? But Penguin Random House was very much encouraging this confusion. In fact, they went in all in on it, even though they knew it was not true. And th this comes to the part where I'm explaining why I sat on this story for a while, because it had not been officially announced who wrote this book, but now it has. It was actually written by two collaborating writers, neither of whom is Taylor Swift. <laughs> Nonetheless, Jesse, show them the post that Penguin Random House used to pitch this book, specifically targeting Taylor Swift fan accounts. Just in case you can't read what it says above the picture there, it says, we're excited to offer you a complimentary copy of Argyle by Ellie Conway. And then in parentheses, or Taylor Swift, question mark. So they're sending this out to promote the book, even though they know perfectly well Taylor Swift did not write it. Laura, is this an ethical way to promote a book? <laughs> I saw this article and I don't approve. I, I didn't care for it. I think... First of all, you're just going to inflame a group of people that you don't want to inflame. Right. I personally believe in truth in marketing, but I'm not really a marketing person. And maybe that's why I'm not terribly good at marketing because I <laughs> do try to be very honest. <laughs> because I, it's not easy is the real reason. Well, Nothing that's fair. But I is. I don't know. This rubbed me the wrong way. I, hmm. Yeah. Jesse, what about you? Do you approve of this? Or does this seem like the sort of underhanded thing your arch nemesis, James Patterson, might do? Mm, it, do it does have the flavor <laughs> of what... Yeah, no, like, this is this is almost stupider than what James Patterson does in the sense that, like, first of all, it is a book from the fake author that is the main character of mm. the Argyle movie. Yeah, I didn't even dive into that, but you're totally right. So it's like, so like, do you remember the TV show Castle? Okay. I know uh, what it is. Yep. Yes. So they, they released a lot of fake book, like real books uh, authored by the fake Richard Castle, right? We actually own a lot right. of them because they're hilariously bad, but also <laughs> quasi entertaining. 
this is like that where I'm like, oh, they're trying to sell this, this obviously this, uh, this fake book to push the movie that is out now. And I'm like, if Taylor Swift wrote a book, what makes people think she wouldn't tell people that she wrote a book? It, it does but seem I, like it would be the more sensible thing to do. I, wouldn't I it? know that I know that she likes to leave clues in her lyrics and whatnot, but like also this movie was in production for a while. So like there's no way they knew that like Taylor Swift would be peak Taylor when That's this true. movie came out. Mm-hmm. So it just seems like mm-hmm. a lot of just like miss just like good, both good and bad timing for this. So mm-hmm. I saw, I saw one of those backpacks with the little cat glass mm-hmm. at a pizza place here in town when I was having lunch with Barry one day. And I'm just like, Oh, those back, those backpacks actually exist. So oh, I bet Barry ran out and bought one, didn't he? <laughs> oh, he was not, he was not happy about a cat being in the pizza place for sure. So, okay. Here's the thing. I've, I looked at the reviews on Amazon and Goodreads and I think it's, This relates to what you were saying about the castle books, because it's pretty clear that Penguin Random House knew they didn't exactly have a stellar book here, but they nonetheless seized on this lame-o marketing opportunity to sell it by uh, co-opting Taylor Swift's fan base, right? I mean, they might as well hand it out friendship bracelets with it or, or something, and it's completely disingenuous and uh, seems like not the or maybe i'll just start handing out friendship bracelets with my next book i don't know but seems like not the way to do it all it's just, right it's it's just it's listen and what's funny is like they were doing this to hand out free copies of the book right. so not even to sell more copies of the book mm. well to get people to post about it on the internet because yeah. that's how you sell books today that is true yeah oh boy all right, game. Jesse, cue cue up that music. Let's talk to Lauren Smith. Lauren, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. All right, traditional first question: If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, figure out what you like to write and then figure out how to write it to market. I think that's the biggest challenge. I see a lot of new writers that say, I like to read this one very interesting, unique thing. But then when they try to write it, it kind of isn't matching anything in the market. And while you do want some uniqueness in what you're writing, you still need to satisfy reader expectations. So read what you love and then try to learn to write in a similar vein what you love. Which we hope is something that you'll be able to sell. And (laughs) I mean, I thought what you were saying about the market was dead on because in small group retreats and whatnot, so often I get people who are writing things that are not bad, but clearly not commercial. And I'm saying, if that's what you want to do, great. But, you know, don't complain later when the sales aren't very good. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) You're making a choice here. Right. (laughs) Uh, speaking of books, you got one, I think it just came out or recently called Dukes and Diamonds. What can you tell us about that? Well, it's a really fun story. I always try to, when I'm writing historical, um, whether it's a novella or a novel, this was uh, in a novel, I try to take a kernel of real history and blend it in in some way. Maybe I tweak some things or maybe I keep a real event exactly as it happened and place it in there. And in this particular story, I wrote a, um, there's a real um jewel thief gang that was all women and run by women. And they would literally run into stores and smash a bunch of cases and steal jewelry and run out. And the police were so afraid of them. They called them the elephant gang. They didn't want anywhere near these women. And there was about like a hundred women in this gang. And they would literally, it was kind of like the modern looting you'd see today. But I thought that was kind of interesting about a woman run gang in the 1800s. You don't normally think of women running criminal enterprises. No. And I thought, well, I'm not really wanting to glorify criminal enterprises or having <laughs> kind of negative, but I like the idea of women deciding to steal things. And for me, I always like to have heroines that have more, more noble purposes. So I thought, yeah. what if I had two um, rich women who are seeing other people's society misbehaving and causing problems, whether to mm-hmm people or to other people in their social circles and to punish them, they decide to steal their jewels. And so they recruit a pickpocket from the streets. Who's an excellent 
you know, at her, at her job. Mm -hmm. And they say, we're going to teach you to be a lady and you're going to act like us. We're going to tell everybody that you're one of our friends' cousins. And then you're going to help us rob these people, like in the middle of balls, during tea parties, at night while they're asleep. And so they make the mistake, though, of targeting a Duke who had broken up an mm -hmm. engagement to one of their friends and their friend had been so cast out into society, she had to leave England and go to the United States. And so they thought, we're mm -hmm. going to punish this guy. So he has a big old diamond and we're going to steal it. And then it kind of, you know, of course, then she gets caught trying to steal the diamond. The Duke shoots her and it's this whole thing. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. cool love story, meet cute, <laughs> all that. So <laughs> it's just so kind of a fun, different take. Oh, good. Sounds like fun. <laughs> it is. I like how you, I like hearing your process of developing that. That's, that's very interesting to me. And it sounds like your interest in romantic fiction began when you attempted to rewrite the entire Titanic movie, just <laughs> save Jack from drowning. So again, here we're, we're seeing how your brain kind of works things uh, around to the way you want them to be. <laughs> exactly. Um, I was only 10 when I tried that. And the funny thing <laughs> is I didn't know that I ended up being a romance writer until in my like mid to late 20s. And it was just really funny that I look back and I'm like, I actually sat down with the VHS tapes and just played minute by minute, it would pause the VHS tape and then write a whole scene. And my whole point was to get to the end <laughs> and then save Jack from drowning. But I think my you know 10 year old self tired out about the first half hour into the movie with like one notebook full and then I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable did, though, I love what, that. Did, did you give Jack some kind of super flannel underwear or how'd you work this? <laughs> I don't even know what my, I think I was just gonna have him fit on the door together, but oh, well. I never even got there. I think I was still in the submarine where they had just discovered the artwork, you know, before I came <laughs> Cause I was writing from like the very beginning. I didn't just cut to the end. I was like, literally, try, it was almost like a screenplay, but not, you know? Yeah. That's so cute. Well, I mean, we know romance is the most popular genre by a large margin. Why do you think that is? You know, I, it's funny. I, I'm really strongly opinionated about romance. And I think it's because I lived my whole life not having a good perception of it. Um, my grandma was a big romance reader. My mother was very anti-romance because she was very opposite my mother, my grandmother. So it was like more like a mother-daughter battle. And I just came to it with kind of no opinion whatsoever. I just thought, I don't want to read it. I have no interest in it. Um, and it wasn't until law school when I went to a, a writer group one time and I was writing what I thought was epic fantasy, like the next Game of Thrones. And this older woman at critique group, she just pulls me aside. And she goes, honey, you know, you write romance. And I went, oh, no, I don't. Oh, my God. How dare you say that? And she's like, Paul Roberts, read it and talk to me next week. <laughs> and she gave me a used book and I read it and I went, I do write romance <laughs> and I, maybe I kind of like this. And then I went to the borders that was near my apartment that day. And I bought like maybe 20 paperbacks of all subgenres of romance, like, you know, paranormals, historical mm -hmm. contemporaries. And it's just like, I'm going to try everything. And I just, from then on, it was like, this is what I write. This is what I love. And I, I think the thing that, you know, people take for granted is that romance is a female empowered storyline. And I think there's a lot of stories out there where we don't, women, especially in Hollywood, you see this, women are used to, to continue a male storyline. They're usually killed. They're usually um, part of a revenge plan. They're like, um, we don't call them agents of change. So they are there as stagnant characters for the males to have journeys. And the best thing about romance is it's not only, you know, hero centric, but it's heroine centric. So it shows that Marriage and romance is a partnership. Both the hero and heroine mostly have equal page time. They work mm -hmm. together. It's not about just shirtless, gorgeous men. It's about understanding someone else's point of view, learning to accept flaws and overcome challenges. And I think that's the strongest message about romance is the healthiest message. And it creates empathy among readers. They've done, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the University of Toronto have like reported on studies of that. Mm -hmm. And I just find it... Um, you know, sad that that the average society mocks what is so beautiful. I mean, I don't know anything more powerful than than love in this universe. What mm -hmm. else is there to die for or to live for than to love other people and whatever form of love that is? And romance is not just romantic love. It can be between parents, siblings, neighbors, friends, strangers. I mean, that's the beauty is that when you read and write these books, you're seeing relationships in such a deeper and more meaningful way, all relationships, you know, like the current story mm -hmm. that I'm writing right now has a, 
a storyline where the father is going to die and it's going to deeply affect the heroine who it's her father, but yet the hero who had only just met him feels like this is the dad he should have had his whole life. And it's a whole other type of relationship. And, Mm -hmm. and I get to build on that. And that's not a romantic relationship. It's, but it's love nonetheless. And I think that's the the beautiful part of romance is that you get to explore the realities of our human heart and and all that comes with it. Right. Okay. You really did a good job of encapsulating exactly why I so very much enjoy women's fiction and romantic women's fiction for the very reasons that you just um, illuminated. And you also made an excellent point for joining a writer's group because it opened the door for you to what has been a very successful um, path now. Absolutely. That definitely changed my life. (laughs) So let me ask a follow-up question that might be a little trickier. So yes, absolutely. Romance sells better than any other genre by a big margin. But I have read that mystery thrillers are checked out of libraries more often. What do you think makes the difference? Why do you think that is? That's actually an easy question to answer. I know that sounds silly, but um, so romance readers tend to be, because of society's perceptions, more embarrassed by what they read. So they tend to read digitally and they also are more loyal readers and they tend to buy the books because they like to reread. I know so many readers that will reread favorite series. And so if they check it from the library, they lose it and they and they also lose track of what series they've read. So when they buy the Kindle editions, it stays in grouped collections inside their sub libraries. And that way they it's it's kind of like a reading log. They keep track of what they've read and it's easier for them. Hmm. Whereas the standard mystery reader tends to be unashamed that they're reading mysteries and thrillers. Right. And, and 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 that also those types of people tend to be at libraries more often because I I usually write at libraries and I see the kind of personality that gets those books. It's usually middle-aged women between, I would say, 40 to about age 75. Are we talking about mysteries or romance at this point? Mysteries Mysteries. and thrillers are actually a heavily read female audience, which Mm -hmm. women tend to read more than men in general. But um, but yeah, they're, they frequent libraries more because they're less embarrassed. <laughs> it's just, right, right. <laughs> you know, I had, a, I had a coworker bring a book to me once. This was, I don't know, over a decade ago, 15 years ago, she had a book she really wanted me to read. And she literally brought it to me wrapped up in brown paper. Oh, because no. She was so embarrassed. You're absolutely right that there's a stigma associated with that. But here I am all these years later now with my, my e-reader on book 20. In the series that she started me <laughs> on, <laughs> no one knows. No one knows what I'm reading except Bill, because he leans right. out at night and checks. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, I visited your website this morning, and at this point, I think you've won more awards than any artist other than Taylor Swift, <laughs> <laughs> including Rita nominations. And I think that's the big deal in the romance world. What is your secret? Tell us all how we can do as well and win all these awards. It's honestly two things. And the funny thing is I've kind of stopped entering contests because I felt bad. that I, was just, I thought, okay, I've gotten as big as I can get. I should just let other right. people. It's, it's like the actor who drops out of the Emmys after they won five times for the yeah. same role. Yes, that's you. I, I want to give other people the opportunity because when I won my very first contest, it was with an editor at, uh, I think it was Penguin. Penguin, she was at Penguin at the time. And it, I literally got the notification at 10 o'clock at night and I literally sat up in bed, read it on my phone and started screaming. And I'm not a screamer. I'm not a, like a a sporting events. My heart will be pounding, but I don't yell or even clap that much. I mean, I very much internalize my reactions. So for me to be screaming in my house with joy was how much that really did touch me that this was the journey because she said in her comments that she would buy the whole series. And I thought, this is my door in, this is my way to being a published author And it's not that I've been chasing that feeling ever since. It's more that I've picked contests where I have felt there were editors or opportunities that were offered. So if anybody's interested Mm -hmm. in contests, you know, look at what you get for prizes. Is it money? Is it getting in front of an editor or an agent that you're interested in? You know, if the editor or agent doesn't read or enjoy, like if they're not a historical romance reader and you're entering the historical romance thing, you know, be prepared to not get a recommend, you know, request for a manuscript. So be smart about it is what I would say, you know, pick logically the ones that have an advantage to your career. And then more importantly, make sure that first, you know, three chapters, however many pages, 
needs to be absolutely polished. I made sure that mm-hmm. the first 50 pages, because some contests have more pages they allow, um, they need to be perfect. They need to be spotless on character. They need to have been read multiple times by people comfortable in your genre. So if it's a mystery thriller, and it's a certain type of thriller, or is it a cozy, or is it make sure you've had people who have the reader expectation of what you should be writing, read that. Do not allow people to beta read. I, I think the biggest misuse of anything in our industry is beta services. I see a lot of big name saying, I've sent it off to my betas. And whenever I later talk to them, you know, and they have an issue with their manuscript that comes back in reviews, I said, well, you send this to beta people, right? And you find out the betas aren't as qualified. So Mm -hmm. I prefer to send things to editors and then to real readers who read voraciously. So I have a group of maybe five or six trusted individuals who I know their strengths and weaknesses, and they're just real readers. They don't have any editing experience. They're not editors. They're not proofreaders. They read strictly for I didn't like this. I like this. I hated that. That didn't make sense. And if I'm worried about the book, I send to those people. But now I'm so comfortable in my rhythms and my patterns and what readers like that I don't have to rely on them anymore. And now they're just my normal kind of arc team when they read the book when it's done. But in the early stages of my career, they were very vital for me in writing correctly because that's how you win those contests is making sure those pages are polished, but also written to market. Hmm. Wow. Hey, you're part of the faculty this year for the WriterCon cruise, so you probably knew I'd bring that up. And yeah. by the way, aside to listeners, it is not too late to register. Go to WriterCon.com. But anyway, can you talk a little bit about the cruise and what you're going to do there? Yeah, so I am really excited. I have been on a few writer cruises before with some other groups just kind of trying out different things. And I, first of all, I love cruises. Cruises are really yeah. fun. If you've never been on one, if you're like me, I can't unplug in any environment. And so being a Pisces, I'm around water. There's literally nothing for me to do. All I can do is relax. And that to me is one of the biggest benefits. And then being surrounded by people who talk and think like you. I mean, I don't know about you, but we tend to be introverted. But when I sit down at a table with writers, I'm never introverted. The conversations we have, everybody understands what it's like to have characters talk to you, what it's like to have a plot twist or how you're structuring a series, just these things that can come up. And Mm so I'm excited to meet everyone that attends the cruise. And I would be happy to do, you know, unofficial one-on-one sessions with anybody that just wants to chat about their career ideas or book ideas or, you know, what they have planned for their, their writer lives. And I, you know, I'm looking forward to presenting on, you know, a number of topics. I I can talk about, you know, writing, you know, how many, how to get your word count up, um, mastering writing tension and emotion and conflict in your stories, because emotion and tension and conflict are the three most driving things that keep readers turning the pages. And then of course I can talk more about business if anybody's up to a higher level in business, I can discuss foreign translations and you know how to build your author brand and and any number of things that people want to talk about. I will have presentations ready. Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you've kind of been a, a pioneer in taking control of your rights, especially those foreign rights that you were just mentioning. How did that yes. get started? Well, I've always seen myself as um, my goal is to be a household name someday. That you know they. Back in the day, they had this phrase, everybody loves a Lindsay, which was a Joanna Lindsay. So my joke in that in my house That's has been, correct. everybody loves a Lauren. <laughs> I want that to be the new thing uh, because well, Joanna sure Lindsay is no longer with us. <laughs> so <laughs> I would like to be the new Joanna Lindsay. But um, I decided early on being, um, you know, an attorney and being someone that studied business. And I do have a business mind. My mother is a banker. My father is a lawyer. It's unavoidable that I'm a business person despite being creative. Right. And having control... I'm very, very obsessed with work products. So not only covers, uh, editing, the overall packaging of books, I spend extra money on interior art spreads so that when people get print books, they've paid extra money and they have beautiful artwork. I, I was one of the first people that did a fully illustrated book, not a graphic novel, but like a 20 plus illustration, illustrated um, eight and a half by 11 hardback book for one of my best-selling series oh, on its 10th nice. anniversary. And I'm trying to always think about, you know, merchandising rights and foreign rights. And to what I always think of is what do fandoms get obsessed with? Because fandoms are your biggest power. And so I think about what products do fandoms like? Can I make those? So my next adventure after I was working on foreign rights and I'm still, you know, producing a lot of my books in foreign, but we're going to be working on reader merchandising now where we're using one of those cricket machines to do special Mm -hmm. color water bottles that have um, cute phrases like good girl Academy connected to 
you know, my branding for my series and just yeah. all sorts of, like smut reader, you know, seeking romance <laughs> and, and, and that, that readers that don't necessarily connect to directly one of my series, but will have subtle Lauren Smith or Emma Castle, my other pen name branding on it. Because I think when you think about your books, you have to think about all the rights that come with them and the opportunities those present. So you're talking audio books, merchandising, film rights, and every writer should always be thinking about what if my career takes off tomorrow, I need to be protecting those rights and be ready mm -hmm. to act on them because that's where a lot of extra money can come in. Right. That's right. We have quite a few aspiring writers um, among our listeners. Can you talk to us a little bit about what a typical writing day looks like for you and maybe a little bit of your process? I am definitely a panster. And so when I, people ask me about my process frequently and it actually buys them when I, when I tell, <laughs> at least when I tell planners what I, what I do or plotters, um, I always handwrite all my books in a college rule notebook. And I have certain pens that I prefer based me on. Me <laughs> It's very important to have the right paper and the right pens. And um, I can actually, within one or two pages, target an exact word count now because I know my average word count is 375 words per front page and then per back page, another 375. So when I write, and I, I write chronologically, I may write for 30 to 40 minutes at a time. And then I very much get distracted and see a squirrel and run off <laughs> and do something around my house typically, or go play with my dog or, you know, then I come back and then I do a little bit more writing and I typically write in the morning. I found my energy level is um, my creative energy is better in the morning. And then I can do administrative work, which is, um, you know, processing tax receipts, looking at earnings, working with graphic designers on graphics, previewing social media content with my social media organizer and doing those kind of things in the afternoon. But when I first started writing, it was all writing, all editing, and it was no administrative work. And I would say that um, the best advice that I ever heard about the two different types of writers are there, you know, it's not just plotters and pansters, but there's also big chunk and little chunk writers. And it's okay to be either a big chunk or a little chunk writer. And what I mean by that is I'm a little chunk writer. I will write maybe one or two pages and then I need a break and I got to go do something. And then I come back. And then there are people who are big chunk writers. They will sit for two to three hours and they will get everything hammered out and they can write a long time. And maybe they do more words than I do, but their process works better by working longer and deeper focus. Whereas me, I'm very much 30 to 40 minutes. And then I have to take a break because the, the creative well for me needs a little refreshing, a little pause, a little thinking. And I think part of that is because I'm a pantster. I need more time between my chunks to think about where things are going just a few mm -hmm. steps ahead versus mm -hmm. planning out a whole novel. So I would say, you know, explore mm -hmm. writing for different lengths of time, writing in different places. I tend to like to write in public. I don't like people talking to me, but I do like seeing people talk. And, and I have my headphones on with playlists as I'm doing this, but I like the energy of being in restaurants or cafes or the libraries where I live are usually pretty active with people and they're well lit. So you're not tempted to take a nap in public. Whereas if I'm at home, I will take a nap. So yeah. <laughs> feel free to explore, you know, where you feel energized, where you feel creative, you know, and, know. and don't think you have to just do one thing because somebody else told you that that's how they wrote their best selling novel was to do it this way. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm all about giving the advice that whatever works for you is what works for you. And I, I'm right. always happy to hear someone else giving different examples. And I, I personally do not have success working in public. And so <laughs> I wouldn't advise someone. So this is great. It's great when people hear a wide variety of things and they can try them all and find out what works for them. I really like that. Lauren, one last question. Other than the cruise, which is, of course, the most important thing, but other than that, what's coming up next for you? Well, let's see. I will be going to um, a local signing here at the Hard Rock um, Casino Hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma mm -hmm. on April 6th, I believe it's that Saturday. Signing then, where, uh, if I may ask? It should be in one of the big ballrooms in the casino. Really? The is there an Rock. event? Yeah. or? Yeah, it's a big is, event. It's called the, the Magic Hard City. It's and not the Magic City. City. I got invited to that and I was so sad that I didn't I was literally could not be in two places at once. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to tell my other local bookstore, I can't, I can't come to that one. I can't apply, but I can, you know, I've got to be at this other thing that's been in the works for a year and a half now. But um, I think they had, it's a big event with a hundred authors that will be in that room, but they're all romance. 
And then of course the cruise in April. And then I believe I have um, in Kansas City in early August, I will be at the Mid-Continent Public Library for the Romance Genre Con signing mm -hmm. on that Saturday. And then I believe I will be in Salem, Massachusetts for oh. the Getting Witchy signing for romance authors for paranormal romance. So that sounds fun. We've been to yeah. Salem. <laughs> but books, Lauren, have you got any books oh, coming out? <laughs> I thought you meant events. Um, you said cruise, so I got up on my, my event schedule. I thought, oh my gosh, I don't even know. Um, oh, I have a really fun book called The Care and Feeding of Rogues that will hopefully be out in May. Um, I'm pretty sure it will be out in May. And it's about a, a female scientist. She's a naturalist who studies biology, animals, and it's in 1882. And she ends up getting into a wager with her neighbor, Sherlock Holmes on Baker Street. And <laughs> he tends to play the violin during their yeah. meetings and it drives her crazy. And that she would, needs to yeah. have a society where they learn things, you know, that aren't really taught to women like engineering and science and astronomy and stuff like that. So she decides that she's going to win his violin if she learns to study men because he thinks she doesn't know anything about men. So he picks, of course, the worst guy possible for her to study, which is a man who's recently returned from France after killing a man in a duel 12 years ago that forced him into exile. So mm -hmm. he wants her to learn about morally gray men, not just the gentleman down the street that she would typically interact with. So it ends up with this sort of kind of rom-com feel where she's dressing mm -hmm. up like a guy and gets sneaking into gambling halls and gentlemen's clubs and choking on cigars and whiskey while trying to understand men. She gets in a fight in a card room. It's all very entertaining, but at the same time, she's building a relationship with this titled gentleman with this darker past who is hoping for a new future. So there's, a, of course, a, a deeper romance that goes on, but mm -hmm. set against the backdrop of this very funny wager with Sherlock Holmes. So mm. that's coming out. And then I will probably have another Regency romance in the fall and then possibly a contemporary romance around Christmas. Well, I want to read the Sherlock Holmes one. We're not going to have to have you back for that. I'm, I'm sure they're all fabulous, but <laughs> you know, Sherlock Holmes, how can you resist that? Lauren. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lauren, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Come again soon, please. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Just a few parting words. Laura, give us the update on the WriterCon cruise. What can I say? Lauren gave us some really good uh, reasons to go, and I wholeheartedly agree. Getting away, being secluded, but also grouped with your people who are going to be supportive of your writing, there's nothing better. This is where we can really get some good work done while enjoying the ocean beaches, some awesome destinations. If you're lucky, you might be you might even see some dolphins. I've seen <laughs> dolphins before, some flying fish. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I'll be working with a small group. I can't wait. I'll be presenting about what? You have to come on the cruise to find <laughs> out. Just to be clear, it's not that we're so secretive, it's but the 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 courses and what we do, the talks all revolve around who's there you know we ask for manuscripts in advance so we have some idea where you are in your writer journey and what your book's about and we can tailor everything to be of most benefit to the people on board right my way was more mysterious and exclusive but <laughs> your way is more factual we did talk about being factual today so uh, okay and let me also remind everyone that WriterCon has its own magazine now, and you don't want to miss the next issue, the last one, the mm. February issue, which, of course, Beautiful. had a romance focus. Beautiful. Yeah, It was just a gorgeous issue and so much good stuff in it. Yeah, good. And also craft articles, marketing, articles on breaking issues. If you're interested, please go to Substack and search for WriterCon Mag. All right. Until next time, writers, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time. Bye.